I want to thank all of you for coming out this evening. Uh, uh, I want to thank the co-conveners. Uh, Jack, thank you for your leadership in this. And all of the faculty who are part of the Simpson Center and its fearless director, who I know is a force of nature here at the University of Washington. Uh, this is my second time to Seattle. Uh, I got a little bit of daylight today, uh, which <laughs> I'm grateful for. Last time I was here was about 12 years ago for a big American Historical Association conference. And uh, for some reason, I literally don't remember anything outside of the hotel and a couple of restaurants. And so I feel fortunate to have had a chance to see more. This is an amazingly beautiful campus. And, uh, and in that sense, I'm jealous that I'm not here for a longer period of time. I think I've said everything I wanted to say. So let me get started. So let me just, oh, can you not hear me? Yes, sure, of course. Yes, no problem. Thank you for asking. So um, just a word, a disclaimer. Uh, the title oversells, um, <laughs> but titles are fun. Uh, and they're fun things to think about as aspirational. So you're getting a mix of the old and the new. And in that sense, I certainly invite, uh, when I'm finished, uh, questions about where this uh, work is going. I understand some faculty read uh, my first book, and there's a good dose of that at the top of this lecture. Uh, so it's in three parts, and I'll just name them now so that you can stay with me. Uh, the first uh, is uh, the backstory. Uh, the second is the new story of the New Deal era, although it's mostly about prohibition leading to New Deal. And the last is um, a, a conversation between the past and the present. And so that's the structure of tonight's lecture. In 1884, a Harvard scientist and prolific writer, a man named Nathaniel Southgate Shaler, wrote his first article on several, on what he called the Negro problem. This was a transitional moment in American history. Like many contemporaries in the years following Reconstruction, Shaler believed that no other nation of the civilized world had a difficulty as great as America's Negro problem. All evils, all of them, old and new, militarism, monarchism, and the racial threat to Anglo-Saxon purity posed by the new global mobility of the Irish, Italians, and other so-called inferior races of Europe in the industrial age paled in comparison to the racial threat posed by the presence of black people in America. He wrote, there can be no sort of doubt that judged by the light of all experience, these people are a danger to America greater and more insuperable than any of those that menace the other great civilizations of the world. Shaler believed that white men of the late 19th century, white men of science, white men of the industrial age, white men of the modern world, had inherited this predicament from their 17th and 18th century fathers who had been too stupid to see or too careless to consider anything but immediate gains when they enslaved Africans in America. It was their presence here that was the evil, and for this, none of the men of our century are responsible, he wrote assuaging the guilt of his Atlantic monthly readers who would now have to continue the heavy lifting of rebuilding and reconciling a war-torn nation racked by uncertainty and anxiety about its future. Just to give a sense of the scale of this work for this one prolific writer publishing The Negro Problem in 1884, followed by the science and the African problem shortly after. The African Element in America, published in another liberal publication called The Arena. The Nature of the Negro, the Economic Future of the New South, European Peasants as Immigrants, the Negro Since the Civil War. All of these titles published in popular monthlies at this moment of significant transition articulates the significant point that the question about racial fitness and the second industrial revolution, or that is the next stage of capitalism, were inseparable. In Science and the African Problem, Shaler presaged a seismic shift to come in the United States 
noting it is clear that we are in the midst of a great darkness which can be illuminated only by patient inquiry. Those who are best equipped in his language to save the nation by helping to lead us in the composition of our ideal society are those who are interested in the Negro problem. And here's the key, have data rather than just words to share with us. He noted statistics will lead the way. Hopefully this slide changes. I've got a button here. Statistics will lead the way to a new understanding of black people's true racial capacity. So what was it about the inseparability, for those of you who are new to this conversation about the relationship of race and capitalism, that tells us much about the importance of this period? The period of the Second Industrial Revolution, contrary to how many historians for decades wrote about it, was indeed a period of modernization and indeed a, a period of modernizing through scientific racism. That racism was not a throwback, was not anachronistic, was not a call to uh, the ancestral vestiges of the 18th century from the colonial period to the new nation period, but in fact the very logic of white supremacy had to be built, had to be tested, had to be iterated and innovated in a period following the end of slavery. In 19th century industrial America, the great scientific discoveries and technological innovations that unleashed the full potential of fossil fuels and set the United States on a course to be the world's leading manufacturer and first modern superpower also produced overwhelming economic misery, disease, death, among coal miners, canal diggers, railroad workers, women, men, and children who populated factories across the country. Inequality in the shape of unprecedented wealth and epidemic poverty called into question the basic principles of a liberal society, that all individuals possessed the sacred right to pursue their dreams based on their abilities and ambitions. And indeed, we know from the work of so many, uh, Nikhil Singh, a former University of Washington person for whom I just taught his first book recently, so his work is very much crystal clear in my mind, talks about the fact that the very notion of private property, the very uh, unit of measurement for which liberalism itself is born, is inseparable from the very context of chattel slavery. The messy fact that millions demanded a fairer share of money and power created the need among elites to explain and justify their success. They could not sustain for long their plutocratic control in a democracy based on universal white male suffrage without ideological justifications. Some decided that a little socialism was now in order to do much, to avoid too much later. Elites turned to universities and the new social sciences for a knowledge base for the defense of their ideological program. And in this social Darwinistic context, all evidence of domination in society by one group over another, as explained by Herbert Spencer, the most influential founder of American sociology and for whom the term survival of the fittest is accredited, came to be seen as a natural consequence of that group's inherent superiority. Inequality based on exploitation, coercion, duplicity, and genocide were subsumed within an understanding that the oppressed were dominated because of their inherent weaknesses. Scientifically speaking then, industrial elites naturally dominated the working poor, Anglo-Saxons naturally dominated the Celts and Mediterranean peoples of Europe, and whites naturally dominated blacks in America. The superiority of a race cannot be preserved without pride of blood and an uncompromising attitude toward the lower races, proclaimed Edward A. Ross, an avowed Anglo-Saxonist and a pioneering sociologist. According to the dictates of Anglo-Saxonism, a cousin to the Nordicism that is being discussed nearby, all lower races were not to be handled in exactly the same way. Although each race had its unique weaknesses, colored races in general were to be treated very differently from European races because the latter were within the pale of civilization. The problem of the proletariat 
of the distribution of wealth and education, the dangers arising from the great social congestions in our cities, the difficulties of uniting one social order out of diverse branches of the Aryan peoples are trials which we share with every important state in the civilized world, explained Shaler. European immigrants were indigenous whites. They were assimilable, not just culturally and economically, but biologically as well. We can now see how English, Irish, French, Germans, and Italians may, after a time of trouble, mingle their blood and their motives in a common race, which may be as strong or even stronger for the blending of these diversities. In this, fourth, I'm sorry, in this formulation, as post-emancipation writers wrestled with the relative challenges of incorporating various European races versus Africans into a rapidly growing US economy, Anglo-Saxonism was indistinguishable from white supremacy. In the words of W.E.B. Du Bois, a student of Shaler's and the first black social scientist to attain national status as a race expert, he said, the widening of the idea of common humanity is of slow growth today, but dimly realized. We grant full citizenship in the world commonwealth to the Anglo-Saxon, and parenthetically he added, whatever that means, the Teuton and the Latin, then with just a shade of reluctance, we extend it to the Celt and Slav, we half deny it to the yellow races of Asia, admit the brown Indians to an anteroom only on the strength of an undeniable past. But with the Negroes of Africa, we come to a full stop. And in its heart, the civilized world with one accord denies that these come within the pale of 19th century humanity. Whatever geology, for which Shaler taught, Du Bois learned from him at Harvard, he did not imbibe Shaler's views of the Negro problem. Another did, however. His name was Frederick Hoffman, and he took Shaler's innovations and ran with them. Hoffman was a German immigrant arriving in the United States in precisely the time that Shaler's first article appeared in 1884. He self-styled himself as a partial, impartial observer to the American scene, someone who literally had no blood on his hands for the, rate, the, the late affairs of the Civil War and the Reconstruction period. He had a knack for new statistical di discoveries and indeed fashioned for himself an early cottage in industry making observations that others had not yet noticed. Now, if I stumble with my words, it's because I started the day at 5 o'clock in New Jersey. So bear with me. Hoffman was, in other words, the Alexis de Tocqueville of this new Negro problem in the United States of America. Hoffman published his first article, Vital Statistics of the Negro, appearing eight years after his arrival in the United States where in the arena, the same publication that Shaler had published many of his articles, he turned to mortuary reports for eight southern cities. Hoffman found that on average, blacks died at nearly twice the rate as whites. And for him, this became part of this early call for new statistical evidence using mortuary reports for proof that Africans or people of African descent were inferior to those of European ancestry. Although environmental conditions were a factor for all groups living in poverty, the two main causes that Hoffman pointed to were high mortality based on consumption and the sexuality of black women as captured by venereal disease rates, which he linked first to the inferiority of blacks in general and the gross immorality of black women in particular. Thus, he wrote, we reach the conclusion that the colored race is showing every sign of an undermined constitution, a diseased manhood and womanhood. In short, all the indications of a race on the road to extinction. Now here is the first indication of the relationship of what to make of all of these new racial categories and scientific arguments. In his first article, Hoffman was on his way to shaping racial statistics into a powerful, full-blown narrative of black self-destruction, racial decay, 
and the futility of reform. He asks rhetorically, why waste the nation's precious resources on a vanishing race? With the forces of logic, reason, and statistics on his side, Hoffman appeared to foreclose the possibility of seeing blacks' situation any other way. Yet within the following year, in 1893, he presented a completely opposite interpretation of a high mortality problem among whites. He did not identify them by their nationality or immigrant status. In their case, he blamed society and called for economic intervention. Inspired by Emile Durkheim's influential work on suicide in France at the time, Hoffman turned his attention to a troubling spike in suicide in the United States. In Suicide and Modern Civilization, also published in the arena, Hoffman said, quote, for the first time, the suicide statistics for American states and cities are now being presented. Across the country, especially in the urban north, where state and county agencies kept the best records, suicides had risen dramatically since the 1860s. Massachusetts, the epitome of America's Puritan past and industrial future, recorded over 900 suicides in the last half of the 1880s, compared to 394 self-killings in the first half of the 1860s, a 130% increase. Connecticut's rising suicide rate, Hoffman found, was even more startling, growing 216% over a similar period. Always striking in its grandeur, New York City held the dubious honor of being the suicide capital of America in the 1880s, recording nearly 1,200 suicides that represented a 52% increase over the 1870s. If every suicide and attempted suicide were actually recorded, Hoffman wrote, now note the move, were actually recorded. In other words, we've now moved from his empirical data to a prediction. If they were actually recorded, he wrote in a dire tone, the army of those who seek in suicide a relief from earthly troubles would assume alarming pr proportions. The plain but impressive language of statistics had given a picture of the darkest side of modern life. The stresses and strains of modern civilization were to blame, Hoffman wrote, and had contributed to increasing rates of insanity and brain diseases. According to an expert Hoffman cited, these individuals were victims not of their own vices, but of the state of society into which the individual is thrown. Hoffman agreed with this, insisting that the total amount of misery and vice prevailing in a given community was a manifestation of something fundamentally wrong in society. And here he notes at length, the study of statistics of suicide madness and crime is one of the utmost importance to any society when such abnormal conditions are on the increase, he wrote in a plea for reform. When such an increase has been proved to exist, it is the duty of society to leave nothing undone until the evil has been checked or been brought under control. The health of the people must come before the wealth of the people, Hoffman concluded that we must be far from truly civilized as long as we permit to exist or accept as inevitable conditions which year after year drive an increasing army of unfortunates to madness, crime, or suicide. It is the diseased notion of modern life almost equal to being a religious conviction that material advancement and prosperity, read capitalism, are the end, the aim, and general purpose of human life. It is the struggle of the masses against the classes. He could have been a speechwriter for Bernie Sanders. <laughs> Hoffman interpreted white self-destructive behavior as a consequence of a diseased society, not of a diseased manhood or womanhood. White criminality was a response to economic inequality rather than a response to what he called a race proclivity. On the white side of the color line, it would take nothing short of emergency measures to save modern civilization from itself. Hoffman's emergent advocacy was bidirectional. On the one hand, he interpreted the data on black mortality as a race problem, a call to do nothing, 
to marshal the limited or precious resources of the nation. On the other hand, he interpreted the data on white mortality as a social problem, a call to do everything possible to leave nothing undone. In a society where the ideology of white supremacy was ascendant alongside this latest stage of capitalism, Hoffman saw no inconsistency in his thinking. In his earliest writings, he was not a social Darwinist in the sense that he thought helping the weak was antithetical to classical liberalism. The problem was helping a race of people outside the pale of civilization who had, according to the latest data, proven themselves to be permanently inferior to all whites, including European immigrants like himself. The city Negro, brought into direct competition with the white race, has usually but one avenue out of his dilemma, the road to prison or to an early grave. He wrote in an article following the suicide report. In this racial Darwinist formulation, permanent racial inequality and premature death among blacks was a scientifically sound solution to Shaler's Negro problem and hear me closely, a progressive means to mitigating unregulated capitalism run amok, or to put it less in the fashion of Malcolm X. He wanted to be an advocate for lessening the burdens of economic inequality among whites through a more effective use of social resources. So there's a shift here in this period that is picked up by many others. Anecdotal anthropological and journalistic assessments of what is fast becoming the argument for black criminality as the sine qua non, sine qua non of the idea of black inferiority had already informed 19th century popular opinion and social practices. Colonial laws targeting unsupervised gatherings of enslaved men and women and conspiring free blacks to ensure against black uprisings had of course criminalized the very act of humanity. Antebellum blacks were often subject to discriminatory policing, even as they suffered violence periodically at the hands of native-born white and immigrant mobs in northern cities. Since nine out of 10 blacks were enslaved until the late 19th century, the scientific measure of black criminality first awaited freedom, then reliable data. As long as, I'm sorry, as late as 1893, as indicated by the absence of any mention of people of African descent in one of the first textbooks on what would later be considered American criminology, criminology, quantitative research on black criminality had not yet begun. This was a genealogy or an origins moment. Another major report soon after, written by Hoffman's colleague at the U.S. Bureau of Labor, written by Carol D. Wright, from whom Hoffman had obtained data before writing his first race article, published an article linking crime to unemployment and the exploitation of unskilled and edu uneducated workers. His only reference to African Americans was a slim mention in a discussion of general trends in industrial nations in the 19th century, where he argued crime roles as a natural consequence of the transition from feudalism to wage labor and from slavery to freedom. It seems likely that Hoffman noted the absence of vital statistics on black crime in Wright's article, then studied his argument that preventing white crime required better protection of the white working class against the ravages of economic de depressions in the industrial marketplace. The shutting down of mines of Pennsylvania or the reduction of work therein, right, this is a tongue twister, right wrote, <laughs> throws large bodies of men out of employment. Crime is the result and the criminal statistics swell into the columns that make us believe that our social fabric is on the verge of ruin. Wright's evocative language reflects the growing compassion of many social scientists who in the wake of a national recession in the 1890s began to argue against social Darwinism. They were also arguing against emerging biological determinism of European criminal anthropology, which was gaining popularity due to the work of its foremost promoter, Cesare Lombroso, an Italian prison inspector. On the origins and solution to white criminality, Carol Wright 
may have influenced Hoffman directly given the tone and tenor of his suicide articles. Another, Harry Vrooman, expressed, expressed similar views and was also a contributor to the same northern liberal publication, The Arena. A socialist writer and organizer of the Progressive Labor Party, Harry Vrooman argued that the whole problem of crime as today expressed in society is summed up in the problem of poverty. We have churches enough, schools enough, moral sentiment enough to regenerate the world in a decade were it not for the awful pressure brought to bear on nine-tenths of the human race which all but forces them to be vicious. Moreover, Vrooman continued, society owed the great army of unfortunates not just economic security but goodwill that encouraged respect for the ethical order and an obligation to sustain the social order. In other words, sympathy and compassion for working class white Americans were as important as living wages and humane working conditions. Vrooman took his analysis one step further by attributing part of the blame for New York's immigrant slum crime to wage slavery and to northern greed during the Reconstruction period. Under Negro domination, he wrote, a black horde of practical savages controlled by Yankee plutocrats plundered the South. Notwithstanding the challenge to universal white economic mobility posed by free black labor, of which W.E.B. Du Bois in Black Reconstruction described as a general strike, first with slavery and then with the possibilities that Reconstruction posed to transforming the nation, Hoffman, Wright, and other progressives believed that at the nexus of crime and whiteness, there was only a class problem. There was no race problem. Hoffman's major innovation was in presenting for the first time a statistical study of the Negro criminal. Whereas in slavery it was a well-known fact, he wrote, that neither crime nor pauperism existed, he began, in freedom, the latest data positively proved otherwise. The 1890 census, according to Hoffman, showed 24,277 Negro criminals out of the nation's 82,329 total prisoners, about 30% based on a population of 12%, Although black men constituted more than 90% of all colored prisoners, just over 22,000, both sexes were most likely to be incarcerated for violence, he wrote, the most serious of all crimes. Out of nearly 7,000 men in prison for homicide, just over a third, 2,512, were black men. Black women made up nearly six in 10 female prisoners convicted of murder, representing 227 prisoners out of 393 total. For rape, the most atrocious of all crimes, he wrote, black men composed 41% of convicts. For property offenses, arson ranked at the top among black men and women as a proportion of the total at 46 and 61% respectively. The innovative and enduring significance of Hoffman's crime analysis was not only in presenting the data for the first time as he had done for suicide among the industrial classes of New England, but also in setting the terms and shaping the frame of analysis. Table after table of arrest and prison statistics from cities across the nation such as Chicago, Philadelphia, Louisville, and Charleston, South Carolina, and from states including New Jersey and Pennsylvania, yes, it was a grab bag of places because that's how new the collection of such data was. Hoffman proclaimed, all confirm the census data and show us without exception that the criminality of the Negro exceeds that of any other race of any numerical importance in this country. The takeaway was not that we had a diseased society, but that when the Negro learns to respect life, property, and chastity, until he learns to believe in the value of a personal morality of operating in his daily life, the criminal tendencies will increase. These ideas spread like wildfire. In this instance, we began to see not only the broader context in which criminalizing rhetorics of European immigrants were both present in this space, but also were leading to fundamentally different conclusions.
In this case, in a study in Boston, uh, at near the turn of the 20th century in 1903, Frederick Bushy noted that the Irish had the highest rates of petty crime and the Italians topped the list for major felonies. There is a moral degradation among Irish families as a result of drink, which is not found among other nationalities. For quarrels, which are serious affairs, for flashes of anger, which mean a knife thrust, one must go to the Italian quarters. This is the context for the local data of criminality that was informing this larger narrative about European races and colored races around the world and what they were capable of, as Shaler had suggested, by turning to such statistics. Except for the Irish and the Italians, they were to be understood not as racial degenerates, but as Americans in process. And in the words of the Harvard economist, uh, William Ripley noted they were fellow passengers on our ship of state. Drilling down even further, what did this look like in industrializing cities across the United States? In Chicago, for example, one prisoner reentry organization captured the zeitgeist of the moment in this annual report an appeal to people to support the organization, keeping in mind the larger structure, which was for progressives in effort to stabilize capitalism, to offer regulation as a means for saving capitalism and the nation and absorbing the productive capacity of Europe's peasant classes, now immigrants within these shores, began to rewrite and redefine against the eugenicist and social Darwinist tie the very definition of what criminality was. In this case, the Central Howard Association described criminality this way. Now before we read that together, I just want to point out that uh, nothing is working on this, by the way. <laughs> but you'll notice this is meant to be to give visual representation of an immigrant, of a white immigrant slum. And in this case, we know it's a slum precisely because the poverty is demarcated by the housing stock. Uh, we know that this woman is uh, a single mother, at least we are led to believe as such, with a lot of babies. Uh, just the kind of exhibit A for eugenicists that would have called for sterilization because those children fighting in the street are likely to end up juvenile delinquents and swelling the ranks of uh, the masses of unwanted, uh, which would pollute the Nordic stock of America, in the word of Madison Grant. Every bad neighborhood in that period, as is true today, comes with an abusive police officer on the corner. Um, and of course, there's a bar which you can't make out too easily off in the distance. If we think about our mind's eye in our contemporary moment, this is a space that marks these people outside the scope of productive capacity in a global economy that cannot absorb its workers any longer, certainly those with the protections of minimum wage and OSHA benefits. In this case, what are we to make of this scene? How criminals are made? So long as there are bad tenements, sweatshops, brutal policemen, bad jails, child labor, dishonest and grinding employers, saloons and gambling dens, so long as boys are taught to fight and allowed to carry firearms, so long as fathers are indifferent deserters and mothers must maintain the family by the washboard, so long crime will continue. What will you help to, to do? What will you do to help this association to prevent it? This organization was not alone. In fact, the archetypal work of settlement houses and community agencies at the time, the very origins of the private-public collaboration that so defined the kind of direct service philanthropic investments that happen in cities across America and in rural communities today, here were pioneered by Jane Addams in Chicago, most famously through Hull House. In this 1909 publication, The Spirit of Youth and the City Streets, she spoke directly to the crisis of young people not being ravaged by their self-destructive choices, but in fact by the ravages of modern capitalism and an industrial economy that had no space for young people to explore their spirit of youth and adventure. She described 15,000 youth 
coming before the juvenile court in 1904, five years after it was uh, built. She described them as stealing from their parents, swiping junk, which was drugs then as now, pawned their clothes and shoes, did any desperate thing to get the dope as they called it. She described a situation of a Polish youth sh who shot an Irish boy in the head. This tale could be duplicated almost every morning. What might be merely a boyish scrap is turned into a tragedy because some boy has a revolver. Sound familiar? We certainly cannot expect the fathers and mothers who have come to the city from farms or who have immigrated from other lands to appreciate or rectify these dangers. Nor could we expect the young people themselves to kill the cancer of modern city conditions. And so where Hoffman helps to advance a conversation about the collection of crime statistics rooted to racial categories that were still being built, and then progressives more generally helping to establish the interpretive frame for how to read that evidence in light of capitalism, now we understand precisely how those ideas moved into the nuts and bolts of urban policy. It turns out that for me, the shift in this period, moving closer to the New Deal, is the argument that historians have long made that progressive era reforms set the blueprint for the New Deal. And in this sense, I argue that in 20th century, an early 20th century moment, characterized by disparate cultural constructions of criminality and victimization, led to what might be later called the New Dealization of white criminality. For those of you who are familiar with Ira Katz Nelson's When Affirmative Action Might was white, might recognize at least part of the theoretical scaffolding here. Borrowing, man, borrowing Ira Katz Nelson's recent formulation that the New Deal social welfare programs, though seemingly race neutral, functioned as a commanding instrument of white privilege, what he calls affirmative action for whites. I'm arguing here that a related development took place in the criminal justice system just prior to the New Deal during the 1920s and early 1930s. That is, criminal justice reforms during Prohibition and the Great Cataclysmic Depression, which begins in 1925, 29, signaled the beginning of the end of white ethnic criminality as a culturally and politically rich signifier of crime in the urban north. For example, the national attention on white hoodlums and ethnic gangsters during Prohibition gradually receded before the anxiety and panic of the greatest financial collapse in the nation's history. Although in popular media and entertainment, the image of the white public enemy would live on later days with the, the Sopranos and remain synced with the Prohibition era and Johnny Depp's public enemies or even HBO's Boardwalk Empire. Its real life counterpart was increasingly rendered invisible or disappeared by first what was set in motion in the progressive era by the rise of a rehabilitative movement within northern criminal justice systems such that reformers consciously sought to reconfigure white male criminal subjectivity through what Rebecca McLennan calls manly citizenship. How did important cultural and political shifts related to native-born white and European immigrant criminality transform ideas and practices pertaining to black male criminality in the prohibition era leading to the New Deal as distinct from the progressive era which preceded it? Urban historians have provided some contextual clues. Well-known demographic changes are part of the answer. Post-war white suburbanization, for example, began to shift the gaze of urban surveillance away from white men. White working class urbanites took advantage of cheap, often mass-produced balloon frame homes, underwritten by restrictive covenants and leveraged by whites-only mortgages. But as is 
the case here, also underwritten by the increasing capacity of the criminal justice system to target blacks in these very same cities because the work of disappearing criminality from white European immigrants of a previous generation was completing. Residing first in trolley suburbs and later in Levitt towns, white men formerly of the dangerous classes increasingly escaped the scrutiny of beat cops and the brutality of gun, squ gun squads, prototypes of late 20th century undercover street crimes units. So, on the eve of New York's first war on crime, sensational press accounts and fear-mongering politicians deployed the cultural imagery of quote unquote Bo Brummel, a white man whose violent and immoral behavior was cloaked behind a sophisticated and natally dressed appearance. He was so troublesome in part because his whiteness and his class were submerged by his were submerged and therefore hid his criminality. I'm sorry. His whiteness and his class submerged his criminality. New York State Senator Kaleeb H. Balms, who sponsored the new law, described the modern criminal this way. Ranging from 18 to 24 years of age, the best dressed man in the community, the Beau Brummel of his time, wearing the latest fashion of coat, the latest pattern necktie, the latest trim of hair, always cleanly shaven, patent leather shoes, and usually swings a cane, hard to identify. If he were to go into a bank or jewelry shop or place where some of you men and women might be working, he is not the man, in fact. He is the last man you would suspect of holding up a man. The modern gunman and bandit wore an ethnic mask at times, but the sheer volume of second generation immigrant diversity among well-known bootleggers in the prohibition period tended, as many scholars have noted, to unite them mostly by their whiteness. Proponents of the four strikes statute defended the law by claiming that racially profiling the foreign born and their children was no longer an effective crime control measure. And this I should have shown you earlier, but this is an obvious homage uh, to the archetypal image, in this case Al Capone, of this period. In a few instances, members of the New York State Crime Commission, headed by bombs, highlighted the foreign parentage of habitual criminals sentenced to life. I've left out an important detail, and that is this. In 1926, New York State passed a four strikes law. It was the first state to do so in the context of the Prohibition era as an effort to close legal loopholes that were no longer effective in putting away, or in the language of that period, just as today, of incapacitating habitual recidivists. They pioneered this process whereby anyone who'd been convicted of three prior felonies on the fourth conviction would be sentenced to mandatory life in prison with no possibility of parole. 32 other states passed similar three strikes and four strikes legislation at exactly the same time period, starting around 1925, when many states, the majority of which, led these crime commissions for the purposes of tightening their laws. They also passed various felony enhancements for the commission of crimes with a handgun and with the aid of an automobile because that troublesome new technology aided and abetted criminals with getting away with their crimes. Therefore, when Khalid Bombs was successful in passing the four strikes provision, one of the things that was very much the context for passage were headlines such as this, brazen daylight a high profile crimes that were attached to the prohibition context, but as we soon found out, oftentimes had very little to do with bootleggers or modern gangsters like the Bo Brommels of their time. In this way, we get a lot of the echoes from that period to our own about the war on drugs and its 
uh, intense mandatory minimum or truth in sentencing policies for the purposes of catching drug dealers, when in fact the vast majority of people sentenced under uh, mandatory minimum drug legislation over the past 40 years have essentially been uh, very small time uh, dealers who were themselves users or simply those in possession as addicts themselves. It is in that context that Khalid Bombs led an effort to build more present prisons, as well as pushing back against early critiques that these laws were draconian and too punitive and ultimately did not recognize, as Hoffman and so many others had argued in the progressive era, for the great army of unfortunates for whom their crimes were indications of the unfairness and the inequalities of capitalism, and in fact, not a reflection of their behavior. Think of these as the Republicans that they were in 1920s New York, which of course, at the time, the governor was the first Catholic governor, Al Smith, later to be succeeded by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. In defending early criticisms, as we hear in Baum's statement, let us not be mawkish or sentimental on this subject. Of course, we must be merciful, but let us not waste all our sympathy on the modern professional criminal. Let us save some for his victims and for society. They began to describe who these people were in their annual reports. They made references to an individual who had a Russian-Polish father or an Austrian mo mother, as in the case of Joseph G whose case history was profiled in the New York State Crime Commission 1928 annual report. Otherwise, he was a very ordinary person, but a dangerous recidivist. Two decades earlier, Joseph G's parentage would have been a key marker of his criminal tendencies among criminologists and criminal justice officials. Now what matters most was he looked like any other American. Remember, these were Americans in process, which marked him as white rather than foreign-born or ethnic. The fact that he could blend in so well demanded that once caught, he should be incapacitated. The modern young criminal is a hardened young man who dresses better than you or I, Bombs explained at a winter 1927 luncheon of the National Republican Club who studies criminal opportunities and lays his plans as carefully as you and I study our professions. And it requires harsh and severe methods to cope with him. The tone and substance of Senator Baum's portrait of the calculating criminal chameleon hidden behind fine clothing and a vanilla facade was meant to counter the opposition's view that four strike convicts were underprivileged young men of humble origins. A groundswell of outrage, outrage spread quickly across New York's criminal justice landscape and swept in its wake leading members of the criminal justice community, including Lewis N. Robinson, a member of the National Crime Commission, who noted the long sentences recently imposed by certain American judges are regarded by European students as a return to the cruelty of the Middle Ages, and a further increase in the barbarities of our prisons is difficult to explain to those Europeans who have in the past looked to America as the birthplace of new ideas with respect to the worth and dignity of all members of mankind. In this prohibition-fueled law and order moment, the old associations of Southern and Eastern European immigrants with poverty, vice, and crime, which had been challenged in the progressive era, were giving way to the new imperatives of crime fighting. The success of progressive era Americanization campaigns had not only opened pathways of European immigrants to become middle class and shed their ethnic identities, assimilation had also whitened the criminal classes. The second generation appear to approach the native born of native parentage in regards to the kinds of crime committed, noted the leading criminologist by that time, Edwin H. Sutherland. Much to the dismay of the nation's criminal justice officials, bootlegging created both the reality of a massive white crime problem and the possibility of an unstoppable political backlash against the new harsh laws. This moment is the closest historical equivalent to what many have argued over the last 15 to 20 years of criminal justice reform today, 
was that if mass incarceration were being felt by white people, there would have been massive outrage against it far sooner. How would society stakeholders behave now, in fact, if the vast majority of the victims of harsh drug prohibition policies were white as they were under alcohol prohibition? At the intersection of the bombs laws tough on crime defenders and the laws white victims as portrayed by opponents stood the reality that the vast majority of 200 people convicted as bombs lifers were at best small fry thieves. They were not the big criminals or modern gangsters or people like Al Capone. This inconvenient fact proved to be a major factor in the law's undoing, shown by the New York State Crime Commission's own 1928 sample of prisoners and a follow-up 1929 report that sampled the case histories of 50 lifers. The 1929 report provided undeniable proof that the four strikes opposition was winning the public relations war. The bombs law was blamed for a series of prison riots occurring at the Auburn and Clinton prisons in New York. A new class of prisoners bore the blame for destroying prison morale. They had no hope of ever seeing the light of day. In this 1929 study, the vast majority turned out of the sample of men charged as lifers under the four strikes provision looked like burglars and people who were committing crimes of poverty or crimes against property than had anything to do with bootlegging and prohibition. The seams of the law finally began to unravel in the wake of a series of riots, which I've mentioned, mistake there. In the case of Warden Lewis Laws, who was Sing Sing's most popular and influential warder, warden, he became a key player in a call against the law. And indeed, in convincing Franklin Delano Roosevelt, by then governor of New York, and Eleanor Roosevelt, led to a series of systematic uh, pardons for people convicted under these laws. In 1930, Roosevelt, as governor, announced a $30 million investment in improving conditions in New York's prisons, including money for athletics, for education, for job training. And here's a scene that's the scene of the all-white baseball team at Sing Sing. Uh, here is uh, Warden uh, Lewis Laws uh, performing in a prison production. Uh, this is what the rehabilitative moment looks like between, say, the 1920s and 1970s, before uh, our contemporary war on crime and war on drugs took hold. Here he is uh, having dinner or having a picnic uh, with trustees. In this moment, uh, this was indeed good news as key players like Laws began to push back against this punitive ethos. The bad news was that blacks were not among the beneficiaries of these new state monies. Prison administrators excluded African Americans from much of the rehabilitative programming. Calling Dannemora Prison in upstate New York a hellhole, black prisoners made a rare breakthrough in the press by drawing attention to the darkening, darkening color line even within prison. John Thompson, a former black prisoner, stated, the colored there only get jobs in the weave shops and cotton shops, and those shops are death traps. Colored man is not allowed to work in any of the shops where he can learn a trade. It makes no difference what he knows about the trade. They are not allowed on the baseball team, nor in the band. The change in tone within New York's criminal justice system after the riots and the renewed shift away from simply warehousing the white working class in, quote, medieval prisons throws into sharp relief that decriminalization was for whites only. George Kirchway, the former warden turned reformer and prison advocate, continued to highlight the dehumanizing effects of mandatory sentencing, the horrors of this early moment of mass incarceration, at least as some contemporary critics understood it and the folly of incapacitation. Far too many people are committed to prison, Kirchway stated at a Wesleyan University conference on crime where he shared the stage with a former white convict, Jack Black. Both criticized the bombs law in Black's words as one of the worst laws ever passed. This dynamic duo of Kirchway and the white convict, the ex-warden, together powerfully demonstrates the currency of white privilege among deserving criminals of the prohibition era. 
They and many others attempted to shut down the prison pipeline as a conscious act of racial nepotism of looking out for their own. As the recession took hold and the Great Depression lurked around the corner, white juries nullified verdicts by refusing to convict white defendants. Law-abiding citizens joined forces with law and order types advocating reform. In one celebrated case, Mary Walsh, a white mother of three, as emphasized in the headlines, was sentenced to life for stealing. But immediately upon conviction, an ad hoc organization of newly suburban white women pleaded for clemency along with the prosecutor in her case. Indeed, Governor Roosevelt, Franklin DR, FDR, with Eleanor, supported granting many similar pleas. In 1932, on the eve of his departure to the White House, Roosevelt put an end to the bombs law by amending its harshest provisions from mandatory life to a minimum 15 years to life. It was a remarkable reversal in just six years during the nation's first war on crime. Just as a point of illustration, oftentimes, and this is more for undergrads who are new to this history, um, we often think about the South as an exceptional place. And certainly, even in our contemporary discussions about racism in America, the South looms large in our public memory as a bastion and container for all things racist in America. This is just an example, a brief example, of the kinds of headlines that could be found in the New York, New Jersey area during this time period. In the case of a black male accused of killing a white church organist literally because she turned a corner and saw him on the street. Uh, in the caption here, which is easier for you to read than to me, he has a frame of a gorilla. He has a gorilla-like black if there ever was one. He stands only five foot four, but he has the shoulder breadth of a man eight inches taller. He weighs 160 pounds. His nose is flat, his lips thick and heavy, his arms hanging down to his knees like the African forest creatures. His eyes bulge, are yellow from dark drink, he said he was 22, but he might have been 40 from his looks. So in this instance, the conversation about decriminalizing whiteness and paying much greater attention, as progressives had, to the larger context of capitalism, or unregulated capitalism in this case, and the possibilities for what it meant for the United States to maintain these levels of inequality had very little to do with destabilizing these now ascendant notions of black male criminality. And indeed, as a looming substitute for what the prohibition brought, the conversation about narcotics and race were very much nationalizing in this moment. And this is just an early example from 1934, just after prohibition in the early days of the Great Depression, pointing to Latin Americans as the source for the marijuana crisis in the United States, pointing out where it is sold, what the plant does, and ultimately the threat that it poses to white people, now consolidated in a more stable identity that can no longer be the vector of criminality in the nation, but the source of consolidating the nation's resources, as Hoffman had early or defined, in a new package of omnibus legislation to secure greater rights, as in collective bargaining and social security, and eventually homes for white people. Here, well used, often referred to example of just the kinds of racialization of marijuana and drug use in the 1930s at this time period. So we begin to see what is this new container much more durable and more significant in scale in places outside of the South for where black people will reside, where there is no longer, as in the case of the last gasp of a punitive reach towards white ethnics or European immigrant groups of the 1920s. And so the transition period where the South and the North come together in this 1950s 15 still from the birth of a nation, we see Gus the savage brute chasing after the white woman who will eventually take her plunge to death out of uh, fear of being raped by him. This is also a scene just for film cre screen credits that uh, Ava DuVernay replays in uh, the documentary 13th. 
It is at this moment where we see, and we've already learned in other contexts, the degree to which, I've lost my screen on this side. I guess I'll just have to go along with you guys. Um, oh, there we go. We, we begin to see the degree to which the link and the rise of the political economy of Southern punish, punishment to racial capitalism for its goals to use criminalization as a pretext in an earlier period for slavery as well as disenfranchisement. The point here is to revisit this familiar tale of American economic modernization, but in fact to link mass criminalization and disenfranchisement, that is, the way in which the Southern period uses felon disenfranchisement not as a measure of disciplining or deterring crime, but as a me measure of creating a new kind of three-fifths clause that will give greater political power to the South, the very source of power that makes possible the lack of non-discrimination clauses in the New Deal legislation, of which certain Northern liberal coalitions fought for in New Deal legislation, which eventually kept 75% of the black and in the South uh, West uh, brown laboring classes uh, from benefiting from New Deal legislation. So, in connecting the relationship of Gus to the devil as the black contagion that will pollute uh, now a consolidated whiteness in the wake of both a new cultural construction that can no longer be identified with criminality for white American populations who are now second and third generation immigrant groups with our contemporary echoes of this moment. Here is a picture of Michael Brown. And then after he did that, said Darren Wilson, he looked up at me and had the most intense, aggressive face. The only way I can describe it, it looks like a demon. That's how angry he looked. He turns and when he looked at me, he made like a grunting, like aggravated sound and he starts, he turns and he's coming back toward me in his grand jury testimony. His first step is coming towards me. He kind of does like a stutter step to start running. At this point, it looked like he was almost bulking up to run through shots, like it was making him mad that I'm shooting at him and the face he had was looking straight through me, like I wasn't even there. I wasn't even in his way. In the Department of Justice Ferguson analysis, where they found, which we all know by this time, systemic evidence of the most vile racism by the police force, both in its attitudes and in its practice, in generating revenue for the city of Ferguson on the backs of its poor and working class black citizens, the kinds of people that on the streets of Chicago would eventually elicit the kind of direct public-private collaboration to build an infrastructure of social investment in those communities that would eventually lead to a more regulated capitalism to create new benefits for entire populations of these groups. Instead, what we read, City officials have frequently asserted that the harsh and disparate results of Ferguson's law enforcement system do not indicate problems with police or court practices, but instead reflect, as Hoffman had long ago noted, a pervasive lack of personal responsibility among certain segments of the community. I'm going to fly through these because it's time for Q&A. So this is what uh, our modern echoes of the very infrastructure of racial crime statistics look like. Uh, more recently. This is a CompSat meeting in New York. This is recent history to be sure. Um, these are evidence of the effects of the kinds of racist, systemic profiling of black and poor communities in the very, literally on some of the same blocks and streets that progressives once uh, worked to redefine white and immigrant criminality as the great army of unfortunates. These re reflect today's uh, racial disparities in incarceration. Uh, here are uh, aggregate numbers year over year of stop and frisk behavior by the New York Police Department before it stopped uh, with the election of Bill de Blasio in 2014 after a federal lawsuit. And here, for, for what people out here may not have paid as close attention to, uh, this is the unimpeachable evidence of the New York Civil Liberties Union for showing precisely what these stops yielded. Um, I don't have a, a laser, but if you look at the top 
um, chart uh, graph, you'll see that the bottom light or turquoise line shows the justification for what Bloomberg and Ray Kelly would have described as the modern gunman, uh, the modern gangster criminal, the person who we should all stay up at night and be in fear of. The whole point of stop and frisk laws were to keep drug dealers and people who would commit gun crimes off the streets. But it turns out over the years from Giuliani's administration through the years of Bloomberg's administration, felony arrests were flat. Program did not produce. So if you could argue as they argue that it functioned as a deterrent, one would at least expect some peak on the early years where then the so-called criminals would have learned not to carry their guns and drugs and then it would have flattened out. But there's never a peak. It's only flat. The next category of misdemeanors, they didn't do much better there. And all that's left are the very kinds of status offenses, by no stretch of the imagination, criminality that you find on any college campus, including this one. Consumption of alcohol on the streets, disorderly conduct, public urination, bicycles on sidewalks. This is what the NYPD was up to over the course of those 20 years. And noting the far graph, the disproportionate impact on black and Latino populations representing roughly 90% of the population. So what happened to Bushy's Italian and Irish criminals? Or another way of asking that question is how many Italian Americans committed armed robbery last quarter or Irish American burglars? Anybody know? You'll get it. Well, most of you are graduate students uh, or faculty or visitors. So um, I can't give you anything. But uh, the answer is we can't know. It's impossible to know. Because the second generation appears to approach the native born of native parentage in the regard to the kinds of crime committee. So what happened? What happened is they stopped counting. And the FBI today, which keeps the most authoritative records of arrest activity for something like 18,000 police agencies across the country, it remains the most authoritative source of local and aggregate national data for the kinds of crimes that are being committed in our community found in the early days when it was first published, it is believed that figures pertaining to the number of Negroes and foreign-born whites who were arrested and fingerprinted can most fairly be presented by showing them in the proportion to the number of such individuals in the general population. Translation, watch out for black people and foreign-born whites. They are the deviation from the norm. By 1940, it is significant to point out that the figure for native whites includes the immediate descendants of foreign-born individuals which means white had become the unmitigated signifier of normal, no matter how much crime was being committed in the white community, only leaving, in this case, Negro, Mexican, Indian, and other. First, statistical white flight, then a move to the suburbs. And so here we have rural and suburban America being ravaged by an opioid epidemic in our contemporary moment. And I'm not going to read the long quote in a nutshell. G governor Chris Christie said, former Governor Chris Christie said uh, two years ago, uh, that we were going to show the true measure of our compassion and not turn to prisons, but to help these people. Sound familiar? So you can see if Hoffman had access to visualization data, this is exactly what he would have presented in his battery of suicide and crime statistics to make the case about what was happening in the heartland of industrial white America. Same as Christie. Here is what happened in, on September 7th of 2016 in East Liverpool, Ohio. Police department arrested two overdosed individuals, 47-year-old Rhonda Peck, Pasek, 50-year-old James Lee Accord, they nearly died from heroin, and in this case, their four-year-old was in the car with them. This is a photo essay by Philip Montgomery published in The New Yorker called The American Opioid Crisis just about two months ago, based on his coverage of a uh, suburb in, of, in Dayton, Ohio. Um, he's covering the loss, the tragic loss, of a son and a brother, and the two brothers are carrying him away. Uh, the coroner's office literally cannot find room for all the dead bodies that are piling up in Dayton, Ohio. Police officers uh, have no idea how to solve this problem and have taken uh, to responding to overdose calls multiple times a day at the same address. 
That same Christie has now found his way into the Trump administration uh, on the President's Commission on Combating Drug Addiction and the Opioid Crisis. And of course, it's, it, if it isn't obvious that uh, the arc between the early period of the progressive redefinition of white criminality, including drugs, and all the attendant crimes that go along with drug addictions and drug distribution, we have here Maine Governor Paula Page blaming it on black people. And I will tell you that the 90% plus of those pictures in my book, and it's a three ring binder, it must have been inspired by Mitt Romney, <laughs> are black and Hispanic people from Waterbury, Connecticut, the Bronx, and Brooklyn. Their names are D-Money, Smoothie, and Shifty. So, Jeff Sessions has recently called for a reversal of the Obama era ruling where the federal government would take a hands-off approach to new legalization laws for recreational and medicinal marijuana use across the United States. And according to the New York Times, none of this will bother the Attorney General, a lifelong anti-drug crusader who runs the Justice Department like it's 1988 when the war on drugs was at full throttle and the knee-jerk political response was to be as punitive as possible. Mr. Sessions has long held a particular enmity for pot, and I would add parenthetically, for black people, which he continues to demonize. Good people don't smoke marijuana. And to quote Walter Johnson in uh, an essay for the Boston Review recently, the history of racial capitalism is a history of wages as well as whips, of factories as well as plantation, as of whiteness as well as blackness, of freedom as well as of slavery. And I would argue here of the racial criminalization of blacks and the de-racialization of crime among whites. Thank you. Let's do it. Um, all right, so we're going to, do you want to call? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, the people who haven't seen me before, the rules of the game are ask a question, no stories. There should not be a second sentence. <laughs> Let's proceed. Oh, and speak up a little bit. We don't have a mic, all right? Let's work around this. Don't be shy now. There's a lot. Yes. Uh, maybe because you didn't have much time, but didn't touch on why the non-Western Europeans that immigrated relating into this construct of whiteness to the benefit of, of not being criminalized or the so-called benefits of, of whiteness. Uh, and I don't know if you had any research on that or looked into it at all. Yeah, so the second project will be um, will cast a wider net to check those dynamics. My first book did not. Um, but I will say to you, I mean, many people in this room are well aware that the rhetorics and logics of Chinese immigrant criminalization match almost to a letter um, in California in the mid-19th century at precisely the moment uh, when this is happening. And the trajectory of those immigrants follows closer to Central American and Mexican immigrants today. So the histories don't exactly graft or map precisely to where they started and where they ended up relative to the Midwest, the Northeast, um, the big cities outside of the South, east of the Mississippi. Um, but there is a lot to be said and many people have said it. So I'm going to cite for short reference uh, my colleague's work, Kelly Lytle Hernandez, who's done um, the best work of any person that I know for doing a, what essentially is a micro 400 year history of a single Los Angeles County jail and to literally see the constancy of criminalizing rhetorics for uh, groups that, who, for whom their productive labor was not their own and for whom the institution, the carceral institution itself, in that case a jail, um, long before the prison uh, uh, mattered from it, the indigenous native populations of California um, through to African Americans in the mid 20th century was meant to discipline them to the whims and caprice of uh, the white settler colonials of California. <laughs>
sorry. We only have like eight more minutes left. I'm so sorry, my dear. Big group. Yeah. You better do better navigate this. I want friends. Oh, yeah. so I'm just gonna I'm gonna come up here. I'm gonna come up here and join you up here. Um, I saw some other hands around. Yes. <laughs> First of all, thank you, Alan Lighten. I'm dying to know your name, Khalil Gibran. <laughs> Good question. I like that. So my, I had hippie parents, and uh, as you well know, uh, Khalil Gibran, uh, his legacy lives on, uh, but he certainly was uh, having a renaissance uh, in the 1960s. Uh, and so, you know, that they were like, what a name, what a person, and everyone was reading him. So, yes. <laughs> it's been hard to live up to, let me tell you. Questions. Oh, so, yes, right here. Oh. So, how does this history, knowing this history, light and maybe change? So, if we think about, uh, well, <laughs> the optimist in me says that. If we knew our history of racial capitalism in the broadest sense, then more white people would not have voted for Donald Trump. In which case, even the piecemeal reformist approaches to uh, deracializing the criminal justice system as it was even imagined in the Obama White House, which by now looks like a um, utopic vision, um, might have continued to some degree under Clinton, although Hillary carried huge responsibilities for the same logics that Jeff Session is trying to reignite. In other words, the basic infrastructure that now defines the war on drugs at the federal level that can be executed by Jeff Sessions is largely owed to Bill Clinton's work. So you ask a question that presupposes for me that if we understood more the choices we make, the assumptions we make, the ways that we think about these things, the way that public safety concerns guide our behavior in ways that we don't think are racist, or the ways in which capitalism depends upon these categories which are themselves inflected by, in this case, centuries of racial understandings that, that most people completely divorce themselves from, um, then our politics might be better, our choices as citizens might be better, um, and we would better understand that the imperial project also depends upon criminalizing rhetorics of subjects um, who are incapable of governing themselves. Um, so all of that as a, at a university depends upon at least the willingness to face truth or to define some kind of truth uh, that is closer to what forms of evidence we would use in this context. That's a final hedge against a kind of truth with a capital T. Yeah, I think, I think that most of our social welfare programs are deeply racialized precisely because entitlement programs have been defined by programs uh, for undeserving black and brown people, period. And uh, we have, you know, I'm not an ethnographer, but I certainly read. And so there's tons of evidence that, uh, that the fact of global inequality and growing plutocracy and inequality is partly an evidence of a politics of white Americans, in this case, who refuse to fight against the excesses of capitalism because they see that the legacies of the regulated capitalism of the New Deal accrue to undeserving black and brown people, when in fact that's actually not the case, but that's how they understand it. So you mentioned the, uh, the Affordable Care Act. I, I'd say that the Affordable Care Act may be um, the best of the idea of New Deal social legislation precisely because there was no generational um, time lag between black people having access to it in the way that was true for the New Deal. Um, but o Obama could hardly be credited uh, for taking uh, a historically informed approach um, to uh, dealing with uh, massive inequality in this country um, 
as a result of knowing that trickle-down um, universal policies have never yielded the kinds of uh, reparative or racially redistributive effects that are absolutely required um, by any moral, ethical, or historical standard that we could, uh, we could come up with. So, so universal policies are not going to get us anywhere further down uh, the road to something that might embody or might prove Nikhil Singh wrong. Let's put it that way. Sure. So I guess that's easier than it sounded at first. You started asking me about the ACA, and I'm thinking 4,000 pages. I haven't gotten there. So, so our first thing I'd say is that um, movement for, the, the, the Movement for Black Lives policy platform is a wonderful place to begin to at least examine what activists working inside of communities that feel the greatest burden of capitalism and racism um, are thinking is necessary for those communities to survive and prosper right now. Yes. So far be it from me um, to offer more than just that invitation as the beginning, which is to say that so much of the infrastructure of policy making in this country, and this is, I mean, I'm at the Kennedy School and I, it's real, um, is precisely a top-down technocratic approach that is often hostile to the actual perspectives and uh, ideas of people who are on the receiving end of this work. Um, and in fact, uh, within the context in which I work, the very concept that the kinds of racial logics that I've described here um, are operative or worthy of either a kind of empirical legitimacy are often completely dismissed as irrelevant to the case at hand. Um, so we should start at least with the possibility that people who are closest to the problem are also closer to the solution, um, and then to build out from there. Great, I'm going to end it there. I'm also going to highly recommend, uh, Khalil has a wonderful piece in the Boston Review um, called The Descent of Democracy. But with that, we got to get into dinner. Thank you guys so much for joining us today.